What are the essential features of classification yards on model railroads? That's what we're going to talk about today. I'm Roy Smith. Behind me, you can see part of the classification yard at Green River, Wyoming on my N-Scale UP Evanston subdivision layout. Stick around, you'll see a lot more of it in this video. Today I'm launching a whole new series of videos about my classification yard at Green River. Today's video is the first in that series. It covers the yard design on my layout as it currently exists. We will look at the essential features and some optional features that I included or didn't include in the track plan for the yard. In my next video, I will show you some changes that I am making in the track plan that will improve the yard and make it operate more efficiently because as we run trains on our layouts, we discover changes we'd like to make. And later on in the series, we'll look at the railroad structures I included in the yard, and after that, we'll do some actual yard classification. I began to build Green River Yard on my layout way back in 2014. Here you see Green River on the upper level and staging on the lower level. This was the first section of the layout that I built. I tried to learn as much as I could about effective yard design at that time before beginning to build it. My goals were to capture the feel of the prototype and to represent the prototype as well as I could in the limited space I had for it. As you can see, my layout is a traditional around the room type layout with a peninsula in the center. It fills a spare bedroom that measures only 10 feet by 12 feet. That isn't a lot of space, even in end scale. Green River Yard occupies a portion of the layout that is 12 feet long and 18 inches deep. One big problem we model railroaders often face in designing an effective yard is the lack of available information about the prototype. That's why we have to do a lot of guesswork. I certainly did. And when I first set out to plan and build Green River Yard, I didn't know anything about how railroad yards actually work. So I had to do a lot of research and watch a lot of videos. I want to thank DJ of DJ's Trains, whose videos have been immensely helpful in understanding real railroad yards and how to apply that to model railroads. I will put a link to DJ's channel in the description down below. I would also like to thank the many people who have uploaded videos filmed at Green River. I want to thank two of them in particular, Glenn Campbell and SAR Unit 63, for their spectacular drone videos of the yard. I will put a link to videos they uploaded in the description down below. Go take a look at their videos to gain a much better appreciation for the prototype that I am trying to model. And finally, I'd like to thank the NMRA whose general design for yards inspired my track plan at Green River. Of course, each of us has to design our yards in a way that meets our own needs and desires and fits into our available space. Along with a lack of information, another cause for less than satisfactory yard designs can be our need to selectively compress everything on the prototype to fit the space we have for it. I'm sure you can understand why I couldn't exactly replicate the massive prototype at Green River on my small layout. And here's the track map of the prototype. Note the four darker through tracks. These four tracks are used by through freights, which don't need to be switched out at Green River. I believe that two of them represent the main lines, which I have modeled on my layout, and two of them are sidings for the main lines, which I did not include on my layout for lack of space. As many as 50 to 75 trains can pass through Green River on any given day, and sometimes you can see up to four trains stopped at the same time here on the through tracks at the yard office for crew changes. As I said, we're going to take a look at some essential features to include in a yard design. First though, let me just mention four general principles of effective yard design. One, Classification yards exist for sorting cars, not for storing them, because cars stored in yards don't make any money for railroads. 
The cars are sorted in the yards according to their destinations and are then sent on their way as expeditiously as possible. Two, it's not the number or length of the tracks in a classification yard that makes a yard most effective. Rather, an effective yard depends on how the tracks in the yard are arranged. Three, yard tracks should be isolated from the main line, that is, physically separated from the main line but connected to it by crossovers. This is important so that yard operations do not foul the main line or interfere with the flow of main line trains in any way. And four, on model railroads, it's important to figure out the number of cars you want to run on your trains and then design the tracks in the yard to fit that number. With these general principles in mind, let's now talk about the essential features of a classification yard. The first essential feature is an arrival departure track or tracks. Here you see an eastbound local freight arriving on the arrival departure track at Green River on my layout. From Main 1, the train takes crossover number 1 to reach the arrival departure track. This train consists of cars that need to be sorted or classified in the yard according to their destination. We will do such an actual classification in an upcoming video. The arrival departure or AD track shown in red runs parallel to the main line. In effect, it is a siding off the main line which temporarily holds arriving and departing trains. It would be nice to have two AD tracks at Green River on my layout, one for arriving trains and one for departing trains. With two tracks, I could have a train arriving and a train departing simultaneously, but space limitations have allowed me to have only one AD track that somehow must accommodate both arriving and departing trains. An AD track should be as long as the longest train you plan to classify. Originally, my AD track ended here where this crossover connects to the east end of the AD track and then to main one. At that time, the AD track could accommodate only 12 cars and two mainline diesels, but I lengthened the AD track and now it can accommodate up to 22 cars. I still haven't gotten around to painting and ballasting the track extension and fixing the scenery around it. I will talk more about this extension of the AD track in my next video about track plan changes. An AD track should be accessible from the main line at both ends. That is, it should be double-ended so that both eastbound and westbound trains can easily and directly enter it or depart from it. Trains should be able to enter and depart the AD track without fouling the yard lead. If arriving or departing trains foul the yard lead, then a yard switcher working here on the yard lead will have to stop and wait until those trains can clear the lead. As you can see, this arriving train is fouling my yard lead and I need to fix this problem. From the AD track, locomotives of my westbound trains can easily go to the service area for refueling. But at the east end of the yard, my eastbound trains encounter a problem. Locomotives at the east end of the yard can only get to the service area by doing a runaround on Main 1, thus fouling Main 1. Here you see the locomotives running on Main 1. 
I need to think about how I can get my locomotives from the east end of the yard to the service area without fouling the main. After a train arrives on the 80 track, a yard switcher then takes over and begins to pick up the cars on the 80 track and take them to the classification tracks for sorting. To do this, the yard switcher needs to have direct access to the 80 track from the yard lead. In a moment, we will discuss the yard lead in greater detail because it is very important. Just two more things I want to say about the 80 track, and then we'll move on to the yard lead. The 80 track should never be used as an extra classification track. If it is, then when another train arrives for classification, you have nowhere to put it. And when a train in the yard is called for departure, cars for that train are brought from the classification tracks and spotted on the 80 track. A readied locomotive couples up to the train, and the train then heads out onto the main line en route to its destination. Now the yard lead. Many model railroaders agree that the yard lead is the most important track in a yard, and that it must be separate from the main line. A yard switcher uses the yard lead to move cars between the arrival departure track and the classification tracks. As you can see, I have a yard lead shown in red. My yard lead is indeed separate from the main line and parallel to the main line. The yard lead allows me to do classification work in the yard without fouling the main line, that is, without disrupting trains running on the main line. But I've got a couple of serious problems with my yard lead as it currently exists. Ideally, a yard lead should be as long as the arrival departure track and the longest classification track, because if it is, then the yard crew can move all of the cars in a train as a single cut or block of cars at one time. With a short yard lead, the yard crew needs to run multiple times back and forth between the 80 track and the classification tracks in order to move all the cars. My yard lead is way too short. It can accommodate only eight cars at a time plus the yard switcher without blocking crossover number one. Or 10 cars by blocking the crossover. And blocking crossover number one is a bad thing because when it is blocked, access to and departure from the AD track is blocked. I ideally need to find a way to lengthen my yard lead. So I can either move the location of crossover number one from where it is now to here, or I can keep crossover number one where it is now, but add a second crossover here. With a crossover at this location, trains can enter and depart the AD track without being blocked. We'll talk more about this in my next video. The classification tracks. Classification tracks are the tracks in the yard where cars are sorted according to their destination. As I said earlier, we will do an actual classification in an upcoming video. 
There are only three classifications on my pitiful representation of the prototype at Green River. More classification tracks would be nice, but I did the best I could in the space I had. Now I need to mention two things as an aside. First, on the prototype and on my layout, most trains are through trains and primarily unit trains that do not need to be switched out in the yard at Green River. They merely stop for a crew change and then proceed on their way. Here, a through freight has stopped and is waiting for a crew change. And second, speaking of crew changes, I've been trying to find a way to automate the stop for crew changes at Green River on my layout. It's a real nuisance to have to do this manually with a throttle every time one of my trains passes through Green River, whether eastbound or westbound. If you have any suggestions on how I can easily automate this stop for a crew change, please let me know in the comments section down below. Classification yards may be flat, gravity-fed, or humped. I believe the yard on the prototype at Green River is gravity-fed because it has a slight incline, as you can see in this photo. With this incline, cars can be kicked into the correct classification track. Kicking means pushing the cars ahead of an engine, then cutting the cars loose from the engine while the brakes are applied on the engine, thus giving cars sufficient momentum to run by themselves into the correct classification track, as you see being done in this photo. Of course, the yard at Green River on my layout is flat, as yards are on most layouts. For me, Knowing the destinations of my trains is very important for yard classification. I can easily envision at least three final westbound destinations for my trains and a multitude of final eastbound destinations, all represented off layout in staging. And I can envision all points along the way to those final destinations. I think it's just as important to consider off-layout destinations as it is to consider on-layout destinations, especially on a layout like mine, which has very few on-layout industries to be served. Remember, what I'm modeling is part of a transcontinental bridge route between the American Midwest and West Coast. There aren't a lot of small industries to be served on the prototype I am modeling. Besides, Industrial switching isn't my primary interest. I would rather be classifying cars to send them in the right direction on the right train. Many model railroaders assume that you need a separate track in your yard for each destination. But this isn't necessarily true. Individual classification tracks can share multiple destinations, although this probably means more switching work for the yard crew. The individual classification tracks on my layout don't have permanently assigned destinations. I would rather just number the classification tracks as yard 1, 2, and 3. Something else. Ideally, classification tracks should be as long as the longest train that you plan to classify. But often that's not possible because of space limitations on a layout so it may be necessary to use two or more classification tracks to hold an entire train's worth of cars. Of course, this may mean more work for the yard crew, and it may also mean that more classification tracks are needed in the yard. All three of my classification tracks are stub-ended rather than double-ended because putting turnouts at both ends of the classification tracks consumes an enormous amount of space. And speaking of turnouts, all of the turnouts on the yard ladder are Kato number sixes. Perhaps I should have used number four turnouts on my yard ladder because number sixes are more space consuming and the geometry of number sixes creates a wide space between the yard tracks. But number sixes seem to work better and are less likely to cause derailments. One last thing about classification tracks. When they are overly congested with cars, it's difficult to sort and move the cars around to get them in the right order. In fact, a yard seems to operate best if its tracks are less than half full. For that reason, I plan to remove about half of the cars that are now sitting here on my classification tracks. Runaround tracks. At times, a switcher will need to run around the cars that it is moving or has moved. Thus, runaround tracks are often necessary. 
For example, earlier in this video, I talked about how locomotives at the east end of the arrival departure track need to use Main 1 as a runaround track to get to the locomotive service facility. Here's another example of an important runaround track that I need on my layout. Watch what happens when the yard switcher is pushing a car that needs to go to the repair shop. At this point, the switcher can pull the car into the repair shop, but the switcher then becomes trapped there. I suppose one way to handle this might be to position a second yard switcher as shown here. The first yard switcher uncouples from the car and can return to the yard lead. Meanwhile, the second yard switcher pushes the car into the repair shop. Perhaps it would be better to use a track mobile for pushing cars into the repair shop. Here you see such a track mobile on the prototype. Unfortunately, track mobiles don't seem to exist in N scale. But I imagine the best solution is to add a runaround track, perhaps here, parallel to the yard ladder where the pointer is laying. The yard switcher could then use that track to run around the car and push it, rather than pull it, into the repair facility. Here you can see that track to the right of and parallel to the yard ladder in a photo of the prototype. Other optional tracks. By optional, I mean tracks that are nice to have, but not essential. For example, I wish I had a track for maintenance of way equipment, such as on the prototype. But there's no space for it on my layout. I do have tracks leading into a locomotive refueling and service area, such as you see here on the prototype and on my layout. And I have tracks leading into a car repair shop seen here on the prototype and on my layout. Of course I don't have any caboose tracks because my layout is modern era, and I don't have any tracks for industries to be served adjacent to my yard because there are none on the prototype. The nearest industry to be served is Crown Oil and Gas, just east of Green River. This industry on my layout is purely fictional. You can go to a playlist to learn more about it by clicking on the link to it down below. Well, there you have it. Those are what I call the essential features for a classification yard. They include an arrival departure track or tracks, a yard lead, classification tracks, and runaround tracks. In upcoming videos, we will talk about track plan changes at Green River that I am making or plan to make. We will talk about railroad structures at the yard, and we will do an actual yard classification. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, be sure to put them in the comments section down below. I certainly hope you will join me for those upcoming videos. In the meantime, I'm Roy Smith. Happy railroading.